because until you get right down to the tips of your toes that you matter and you demonstrate it to yourself, it's really hard to believe that you matter to anybody else. Even when people show you that you matter, you won't believe it. You'll say, oh, they're faking it. They're doing that to be nice. Well, they want something. But it's often because you don't matter to yourself. Cue music. Places, everybody places. We're starting in three, two. Welcome to the Autoimmune Hour, where we look at the rise of autoimmune disorders. I've brought together top experts that range from doctors, specialists, nutritionists, researchers, and even those recovering from autoimmune to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information about autoimmunity and how to live your life uninterrupted. Thank you for joining us here on the Autoimmune Hour with Sharon Saylor. And we don't want you to worry about taking too many notes, so you can join the Autoimmune Hour's Courage Club, and we'll send you the transcripts and show notes from every episode. Sign up now at understandingautoimmune.com. Now, back to your host, Sharon Saylor. Welcome, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour, Thriving to Surviving with Sharon Saylor. And I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And it's just such an honor and a pleasure to be with you here again on another episode. And I just keep finding the most amazing guests. You know, when I first started out, I started thinking about autoimmune in a I'll say a very narrow way, like find a cure, find a cure. That was sort of my face forward, plunging forward. But as I began to experience the healing process, I realized there was so much more to healing. And I've just got another amazing one for us tonight. And this is a topic that I touch on some with some of our guests, but not in great detail. And when Roberta Shaler and I were talking. I said, you've got to come on the show because your expertise is what we need to hear. So let me introduce her. And she's a relationship consultant, mediator, and speaker. Dr. Roberta Shaler is known as the relationship help doctor, and she provides urgent and ongoing care for relationships in crisis. Her mission is to help people stop tolerating abuse. Even the United States Marines has sought her help. She's just awesome. You guys are going to love her. But let me finish a little bit more so you have some background of why I had to have her on the show. Dr. Shaler focuses on helping the partners, exes, and adult children of those relentlessly difficult people she calls hijackals. I love that term. We'll talk to her about that. And to stop the crazy making and save their sanity. She's the author of 16 books, including Escaping the Hijackal Trap and Stop That Crazy Making. She also has two podcasts of her own, Emotional Savvy Show and Save Your Sanity. And her own channel, Emotional Savvy on Binge TV Network. So welcome, Dr. Roberta. Thanks for being on the show. No, it's a delight to be here with you. You know, I just love your podcast and your blog posts and everything that you talk about. And I'm so on board with my work outside of the autoimmune hour. We talk to each other about a lot of things that are similar. I talked about dealing with difficult people as well in my body language work and how you save yourself using nonverbal communication. (laughs) And so Roberta and I share a lot of similar thoughts about this idea, but we were talking recently and we both were sort of nodding our heads as we were listening to each other's stories about this idea of how tough it is to talk to medical professionals. Oftentimes, I like to call them the white quote authority, because oftentimes they get in their head that they know best, and that I, even though this is my body and I'm experiencing everything every day, couldn't possibly know what's going on. So I wanted to have Dr. Roberta on. And she's had some both personal and a lot of professional work around helping people. I'll say stop the crazy making, but we're going to talk about stop the crazy making in the sort of the medical sense, these uh, talking to medical professionals. And Dr. Roberta, share with us. I know when we were talking previously, you shared with me a couple of amazing stories (laughs) about having to deal with medical professionals. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, there are lots of wonderful medical professionals. So I just want to start there, Sharon. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I am not painting a broad brush, but when you bump into those hijackals in the medical profession, right. it can be so intimidating. <laughs> yes, and you know, let's define a hijackal. A hijackal is a person who hijacks a relationship for their own purposes and then relentlessly scavenges it for power, status, and control. 
And so if you go to Google and you look up what are the 10 careers that are most attractive to people with these kinds of uh, patterns, traits, and cycles, you'll find that the medical profession attracts them, their attorneys, their CEOs, their um, <clears throat> clergy, there are anywhere that you can have power over another human being and that it is part of your role, therefore gives you outside authority, is something that's attractive to people who have these patterns, traits, and cycles. And so, yes, some of these people believe that MD stands for medical deity. Oh, I love that. <laughs> now, not everyone. I mean, Roberto and I have talked, and we've both over the years built our own amazing teams of awesome doctors and other healthcare providers that give yeah. us excellent care. But we've got a couple of horror stories and want to share that you can get out of those sorts of power diversity, power changes, power hierarchy, I guess would be a better word with uh, grace and ease and and come away with your own sanity. So share with us, you shared with me one story, share with us a couple of stories that you have sure. about how you... Sure, well, I'll, I'll just preface my story by saying that I used to own a holistic health and yoga retreat. I had lots of practitioners in. I was, most of my clients at that time were people with life-threatening diagnoses and their families. So I was in and out of the hospital all the time working with these professionals, working with my clients. So when it came to my turn last year to have some other kind of interaction, an up-leveled interaction, I ended up in the hospital after for years going to my local osteopath and saying, you know, I have these symptoms and they say, Oh, you have pneumonia. Um, and let's throw all these drugs at it. And the first time it worked, the second time it sort of worked, the third time it didn't work. And the fourth time there was an insistence that we do it again and it didn't work. And so I went to the hospital or to urgent care actually. And I said, I'm not leaving till you find out what's wrong with me. And so I was hospitalized for four days and they found out what was wrong with me. And they started with dire news, you know, oh my goodness, you've got this diagnosis. And I'm like, hmm. And of course I have my computer with me. So as soon as they got out of the room, I, I looked up things and I understood why they, they were giving me this look like, don't you understand what's going on with you? And I'm like, yes, I do understand, but Google is not the be all and end all of life as we know it. So anyway, I was referred to a pulmonologist. And uh, previously in 1989, I had had a traffic collision, a near, near fatal traffic collision, and I punctured both my lungs. So I'm thinking, okay, you know, after all this time, the pigeons have come home to roost, you know, I've got some things going on with my lungs. So I went off to this pulmonologist and he said, well, you've got to have the surgical procedure. It's called VATS. And what they do is they poke holes or they go in and they open up your lungs and they take samples or they go in and they poke holes in and, you know, from, they don't open your lungs, like open your chest. They, they do it laparoscopically, but they make holes in your lungs and go in and take things out. And so Is I said, to horrible. Him, yeah, yeah. And I said to him, but you know, I've already had both my lungs punctured and I really don't like that idea. What is the risk? And he said, oh, well, the risk for you in the beginning, he said, oh, you know, two, three percent. And I, then he looked at my chart and he said, oh, yeah, for you, a little heightened, maybe 10 to 12 percent chance that you'd end up on a ventilator for four months or so in the ICU. And I, he said, you go home and think about it. I said, I don't have to. I'm not having it. He said, you go home and think about it for a month. So I came back in a month and I said, no, I'm not having it. And his response was, OK, well, you can leave now. You're wasting my time and you're going to die anyway. Wow. <laughs> wow that's yeah. that's a slap in the face yeah so as you say the white coat authority um like no a you're wrong b you don't get to talk to me like that c you don't get to talk to anybody like that and you know i have presence of mind i'm not living here in fear so i said to him i don't have an expiration on the bottom of my foot you don't know that and you're fired. And so I went to his boss, who was the head of the department, and explained everything. 
haven't seen that guy around in the last year. But that aside, um, after she got over her defensiveness, she said, would you like to be my client? And we have a very straight across relationship. And one of the ways that you and I were talking about it, Sharon, was I want equity in my relationships. So, you know, I have a doctorate, they have a doctorate. Um, if somebody calls me, you know, miss somebody, which they seem to like to do, I correct them. And then if the doctor calls me by my first name, I will, I will say, I call them by their first name. And when <laughs> they do that, they're stunned, absolutely stunned. And that's how I determine whether or not we're going to have a collaborative relationship. If they're stunned, but they don't say anything, we're good. If they're stunned and they want me to call them doctor, and then I say, you call me that too. We're equals and I'm, you are just one part of my team. I have the body. I know what's going on with it. You have the knowledge about other bodies and I will share my personal knowledge and you will tell me your general knowledge and we'll figure something out. And that's one of the ways I calibrate a doctor worth working with. Some of you might be going, oh my gosh, Roberta's done this a lot. So she's very comfortable doing that. And I think it's very profound when you're able to speak your truth authentically and with perfect clarity like she has here for us and grab the transcript so you can practice that for sure. And there are other ways because I don't have a doctorate, so I can't claim the same ground as doctorate, but I do claim that human to human and you can treat me as a human being. Yeah, like I think when you have that conversation, Sharon, I'm sure you've mentioned this many times, it, when you have that conversation of how are we going to be a team, not not a hierarchy, but a team. Like you have a body of knowledge that's general to medical things, and I have a body, and I know all about it. So we are a team. We are not you telling me what to do. It is me hearing what you have to say, giving you feedback, and us deciding how to do it. And I'll tell you, even with my new pulmonologist, she said to me, well, we're going to try the, these drugs, and you have to take uh, this drug, mycophenolate, and you take it with prednisone. And I said, oh, no, 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 we won't be having the prednisone. So what do, you, what do you mean? She said, I said, no, you know, we'll try the other one, but we're not having the prednisone. And she, there was a moment when we just gazed at each other. And then she said, oh, well, I've never done it that way before, but we could try it. And I thought, all right, now we're on the same team. Because, you know, prednisone to me is a last resort drug. And I'm not at a last resort for my body. I have a super sensitive body. So you give me a little bit of something, it's probably going to do more than you think. So we don't start with the big doses. We start with the little doses. <laughs> and that's the power of knowing your own body. Roberta and I have talked before about the idea of journaling, what's going on for you. I mean, some people keep food journals and other people keep sort of a, what I'll call emotional journals. I also like to keep symptom journals and outcome journals and intention journals because oftentimes you may know int intuitively, oh man, I'm hypersensitive. Like Roberta said, it just takes a little bit and we're off to the races where someone's trying to mega dose because that's what the stats say. That's what is most people. And yet, Sometimes I found that I pull out those journals and I'm able to have my own backup information that if a doctor is pushing me, I could say, look, these are what the things that happen on these other prescriptions and these are the doses I was taking and those are way below the clinical standard doses. And right. so sometimes that helps you if you come with some backup information. Uh, it's, there's no problem. I've always had doctors been very happy when I've come as an informed person. It may be as simple as this that you say to your doctor. Do you know, if I have a piece of chocolate or I want to have a piece of chocolate, I have to have it before 10 o'clock in the morning or else I won't be able to sleep for 16 hours after I have it. I know this about myself. So if I can say that or if I have a cup of coffee, I have to have it before 9 a.m. and only one and never again if I'd like to sleep that night. Little clues that you can give someone to your sensitivity or how your body works on a daily basis is your part in the equation of working with the medical person. 
so that they go, oh, well, that is super sensitive. You know, many people can drink coffee five minutes before they go to bed. And then they begin to have some very common way of calibrating what you're talking about. And the important thing is you have the right to continue to confirm your own sanity. Sometimes these yeah. hijackals, and they're not just in the medical professional, you might have some in your private life too. <laughs> so you have the right to confirm your own sanity because you know your body mm -hmm. best. Yes, you do. And, and believe that, you know, some people are not in tune with their body. If you're not, Become in tune with your body. What Sharon was saying about having a journal, you know, just keep a little journal. You know, I ate this today, and then five hours later say, and here's the result of eating that. I hadn't noticed. Now I see a pattern. You begin to see patterns. Or maybe just my saying, you know, can you sleep after you've had a bar of chocolate? Maybe that's something that you hadn't thought about before because you thought it was stress or anxiety or whatever it was that was keeping you awake, but maybe you're sensitive to chocolate. You know, these are the things that we need to learn about ourselves. And when we go to a doctor, let's reduce our anxiety and going. And all that we've talked about so far is going to help because we now are feeling like we're going to see a team member. And if your doctor scolds you about something, you know, gets on your case about something. Ask for help to get that implemented in your life. If you're having difficulty taking things on a regular basis or whatever's going on and that you think the doctor's going to say, well, why didn't you do that, you know? Or why didn't you lose 20 pounds when I told you to or whatever? Then go back and say, own it. You know, I didn't do well with this, and here's why I think, why do you think I didn't do well, and how could I do better? And keep asking for their help, because that's what they're there for. They're not there to give you a directive only. Sometimes we need that. But they're also there to help. And when you can say, here's where I'm having difficulty, and pinpoint it, that helps them. Oh, it does help them too. And make sure that they're really listening. I have had to uh, tell a doctor one time, and this sounds stern, but it was effective in continuing the relationship, actually, where I kept feeling that they were diminishing everything I said. It was like, oh, you know, that's not a big thing. But to me, it was a big thing. It was really affecting certain areas of my life. And I finally said, asked them, do you have a chronic disease? And they said, no. And I said, do you, any, do you anyone you love have something long-term that affects the, their life at all? Right. And they said, no. And I said, then don't tell me how I feel. All right. Well, he was quite stunned for a minute, but I just sat there in silence and let the silence be the rest of the answer. Perfect. And he came back and said, okay. And then all of a sudden he started to listen. So there are ways that you can change it even when you feel like this person isn't listening to me push back into listening to you <laughs> yeah, and let's generalize that Sharon to every relationship in your life every relationship can be enhanced every relationship benefits from you being clear and you not not being afraid to ask for what you need and want and say what's so and not not end the whatever it is you say with laughter as though you're already discounting yourself. Don't do that. Learn to know that you deserve to take up space and draw breath. And therefore, in my opinion and in my work and my books, I talk about the definition, my definition of assertiveness. And assertiveness means that at any moment, you know that you have the right to take up space and draw breath and that you have the right to say what you think, feel, need, and want. As long as you don't talk about another human. So you don't say things like, well, when you do this, I feel that way. Who cares? Because when somebody does something, I choose how I feel, right? I, I give the meaning that somebody says all the meaning it has. So then I'm choosing how I'm going to respond to it. So don't talk about other people. Just simply say, you know, I would like to be a respected partner in this relationship. And to do that, I'd like to share and feel free and safe to share what's in my mind and heart. And I, I really appreciate it when I feel that I'm heard. Mm, beautiful. And so you just lay something out there and then you observe. 
you said those words and you put them on a table and you just let them sit there and you see, did the person pick it up and say, oh, that's interesting. Okay, you're right. I really would like to hear what you have to say. Or did they go, oh, yeah, okay, and then start talking about themselves. Because every relationship is something you can observe what happens when you disclose something, when, particularly if you do it in the way that I just described. And, and, you know, I write about that because I gave it a name that way, and I wrote about it in Kaizen for Couples, although it appears every relationship. But I call it the personal weather report. And when you get good at this, I developed it about 25 years ago because people were using this thing called whole message. And when you do this, I feel this way. And I thought, oh, no, I don't like that. I was training in a lot of corporate events and knew this is what you're supposed to do. No, that's not going to work because that's just veiled blame. Mm. We need to own our thoughts and our feelings and our needs and our wants, and then know that we are entitled to be assertive, that we can say that as long as we don't blame anybody else for it or cause, even speak about another human. And that's true when you go to the doctor. Like, you know, for me, I would really like to have my knowledge of my body respected. You can say that without laughing or trying to make light of it or anything. You can practice in the mirror. You know, I would really like to feel that my knowledge of my body is respected. And then just look at the person. Don't make light of it. Don't laugh. Nothing. And then you begin to have somebody who's, you know, able to listen to you. Well, that's a powerful concept. I'm, I'm glad you brought up that idea. My next question was going to be, oh, my goodness, you know, for years I learned this idea of when this happens that sort of pointing out and then pointing back type of conversation. We need to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to talk more with Dr. Roberta about this idea of actually being able to know what we want to say. If we haven't ever practiced this, it might feel like something very foreign, she's saying. So we'll be right back after this quick commercial break. Life Interrupted Radio will return after these messages from our sponsors. It's great sponsors like these that keep this show coming to you every week. Be sure and stop by LifeInterruptedRadio.com to learn more. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living. A chance to see new hear different, and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for, that new understanding that will enhance your life, and that positive connection that will support your growth. So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Listen and imagine. It takes five seconds to send a text, and for those five seconds, you're driving blind. Life is worth more than a text. Stay alive. Don't text and drive. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Sharon, and of course you know me from here on the Autoimmune Hour. Maybe you don't know I'm also an author. My latest book is for kids. It's Pinky Chenille and the Rainbow Hunters, a winner of a five-star reader's favorite review. It's perfect for your early reader and a great bedtime story for your young adventurers. Check it out over at PinkyChenille.com. That's P-I-N-K-Y-C-H-E-N-I-L-L-E.com. See you there. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor, and tonight we're here with Dr. Roberta Shaler. I know, that's a tongue twister, Saylor, Shaler. I'm getting all confused there, but it's Shaler, and she is the relationship help doctor, and we have just had this awesome first 
opening part of the show where we've learned so many fascinating new ways to stand in our own power, to know our own truth, and be able to speak it without blame. When I love this, where she said, veiled, now remind me, it was veiled blame, blame, veiled blame. I love that. Because I remember being taught that for the well, longest we were. time. You know, the technique was called the I message and that we should learn to send I messages. When you do this, I feel this way. No, 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 no. Don't blame your feelings on another human being. <laughs> Don't do that. Own them. Okay, I feel this way. So I was talking before the break about the, the personal weather report technique that I, I developed and I wrote all about it in Kaizen for Couples. And in, don't worry about the couples part. It's all that I talk about in relationship is in there. And if you happen to be in the workplace, I wrote a book for that too. It's called Wrestling Rhinos, Conquering Conflict in the Wilds of Work. And everything's in there too. <laughs> but it's important for us to understand that it, when we get with a medical professional and we want that sense of, I came to you for your expertise, but I come as an expert on my body, that we have a, a way to talk to somebody that lays something in front of them that is valuable. And to be able to know that you have the absolute right to assert what you feel, what you think, what you need, and what you want. As long as you don't say anything about another human being is powerful. But you have to learn to do that. So here's what I have my clients do, Sharon. And I have clients all over the world because I work this way through video conferencing. Um, I have them set their cell phones, the alarms on their cell phones, for five times a day. And at each time it goes off, I have them use a little breathing technique. It's called 478 breathing. So you breathe in through your nose fully for a count of four. You hold it for a count of seven and exhale through your mouth for a count of eight. You do that three times to reoxygenate your body, get rid of the carbon dioxide. And then you just simply say, what am I thinking right now? What am I feeling right now? What do I need right now? What do I want? So that you start to get in tune with yourself so that you can express at any time. You're constantly calibrating what you think, feel, need, and want, and you can express it. So when you need to, you're in touch with it. Oh, that's awesome. I thank you for sharing that. That's very easy to do. Mm -hmm. I know it probably sounds a little bit easier for some than others, but definitely practice. Now, I, do you suggest perhaps writing that down so we can keep track of uh, and then we can practice getting better at it? Because I'm thinking maybe if I'm just first doing that, maybe what I want is a chocolate bar. <laughs> maybe not too deep. <laughs> it might be, or you might realize, you know, what do I want? What do I need? I didn't know I was thirsty. But now that I stop and have a moment, see, I, I think about life this way, Sharon. I think that we're encouraged by the media and, and motivational speakers and all kinds of books to live like this. And what this means to me is this is your head and this is your feet. And you're, intent, you're, you're encouraged to do more, be more, have more. So you're kind of leaning forward into life. And so there's stress in this because you know that if you stop, you're going to fall on your face. Mm, yes, so, you're plowing forward almost against the wind. That's right. And so when I, I use this technique of setting the phone, it's a moment to come upright, to be present, fully present, to breathe deeply. And then just get in touch with yourself. What do I think? What do I feel? What do I need? What do I want? Now I've got my feet under me again. Now I can slowly go back into the world. And maybe I won't pitch forward quite so far because I'll bring myself back when the alarm rings again. Now I start getting into the present moment and I start actually enjoying my life much more because I'm not always living in the future. What needs to be done, do more, be more, have more, repeat, you know? And and that kind of frenetic behavior we don't want to engage in because it's very hard on our immune systems, very hard on our neurological pro, our wiring. <laughs> it's just hard on the body. Mm, and there's, there's nothing that you need to do beyond what you're doing in this moment. Sure, have a plan, know how it's going to unfold. But I can't make tomorrow happening by leaning into it today. Wow, 
I love that. I was thinking about something I learned years ago from one of my mentors, how this is in tandem with that. He used to say that whenever you had one of those moments where it was sort of an ouch or you felt a little winged by someone, as we call it, Mm -hmm. he said, stop and say, what did I see, hear, and feel that led me to believe? And that was really Mm -hmm. powerful about saying, stopping in the moment, go, oh, that was an ouch moment. What did I see, hear, and feel that led me to be triggered or led me to believe that that was an ouch moment? Mm -hmm. And then then we take that one step further here with what you're teaching us. That allows us to go, okay, where where am I at with all of this? What is actually happening in the moment? And Mm -hmm. I like that. I like that a lot. And imagine what that does to your your close personal relationships or your partnership with, you know, whether it's business or a life partner. But if it's a life partner that you get so that you can both hear those messages and that you're in a welcoming, safe space to do that. So many of the couples that come to me, and as you said in my bio, I work with relationships in crisis. They're not listening anymore because they're so afraid. And so then they they back off from speaking, and now pretty much we've got this going on, <laughs> and or this all the time. So they're in isolation in a partnership where that's the exact opposite of what they want, and they no longer feel that they could communicate with safety. And this is one of the ways that we begin to move them back to being able to be safe, to communicate. Absolutely. And we've learned from Sarah Payton, and she's been on the show a couple of times about the concept of, she was saying that people are always asking themselves two questions, like a radar beacon going around in their head is, am I safe? And do I matter? Mm -hmm. And this is awesome, Roberta, it really adds a doable aspect to those two questions of being able to answer ourselves in real time those two questions that's fantastic and it's a big question i mentioned to you when we were talking that one of my books soul solitude taking time for our souls to catch up on the back of that book um that i wrote with my partner uh and he's brilliant so you want to get that book uh (laughs) but on the back in great big letters the first thing it says is you matter with an exclamation mark because until you get right down to the tips of your toes that you matter and you demonstrate it to yourself, it's really hard to believe that you matter to anybody else. Even when people show you that you matter, you won't believe it. You'll say, oh, they're faking it. They're doing that to be nice. Well, they want something. But it's often because you don't matter to yourself. And so when you get a diagnosis of some kind, this is a big wake-up moment to say, wow, I get to look at everything that's going on in my life because it's being reflected in my body somehow. And maybe this is an educational opportunity that I should embrace fully and find out at what level am I mattering to myself. You know, when I had the retreat center, And I would be working with my clients and they were going through these diagnostics and and getting all kinds of things. One of the most important things that I would say to them is, you know, let's get down to the bottom line here. Want to live? And they would say, well, of course I want to live. And I said, oh, not so quick, you know, grasshopper. You know, do you really want to live? Do you want to live the life you're living? Do you want to live with the people you're living with? Do you want to live with the relationships you have? Do you want to live with the career that you've chosen? Do you want to live in the community in which you live? Do you want to live in this part of the world? Do you want to live? Because if you want to live, it's a huge component for what you're willing to do to change your health. That's powerful. And I'm reflecting on what Dr. Naeem said on the show a couple of weeks ago. Uh, He's a specialist out of Toronto. And he was saying that a large percentage of his patients, when he first begins to speak to them about what needs to happen to create healing in their life again, he finds they don't have, they haven't yet set the intention to get well. Exactly. Uh, That part about intention is so powerful that is always shocking to me how a lot of people 
don't set that intention. And he was also talking about secondary gain, which was an interesting concept to me as well. About is there something I'm gaining from maintaining that ill state? Let me give you an example. I had a client, a young man with two kids, a brilliant cartoonist. He was just coming into his own. He was 32 years old, just coming into his own as a cartoonist. And he came to the farm. My retreat was called Serenity Farm Retreat. And he came. And pretty soon I realized that he had an issue with his parents. So we had the parents come. And we talk, I talked with the parents. I talked with him and his parents. I talked with him alone about his parents. And he honestly had a very troubled relationship with his parents. And the way that they were interacting with him was even troubling to me. And so the balance between wanting to not be in relationship with his parents and wanting to be in relationship with his children was really in crisis because the, the fact is when we got to that question, do you want to live? And I mean, I don't mean it in a, this kind of way. I mean, like really, when you get inside everything that's going on in you, what is your visceral response to do I want to live on every level? And he could, he said, no, I don't. And I said, well, you know, we're at the stage in your treatment and all that we really need to understand this intention because you're going to cooperate with the treatment in a way that is going to do everything you can to get well, or you are going to go through the motions so that you could say that you did, or you're not going to do it at all. And we need to know, what are you going to do? Because this is your life. And we talked about it. I worked with his parents. They would not back off. They didn't want him to be a cartoonist. They felt that he was wasting his life. He'd been a, a Olympic swimmer or close to it. And then they were all invested in what he could be and how he was wasting his life being a cartoonist. And they were on him all the time. And his relationship with his wife was not terrific either, but he had these two children. And, you know, after a while, he just said, no, I don't want to do it anymore. I, I don't want to do it. He said, I'm actually thankful that I've got something that's going to take me out because it saves me from taking me out. And he was honest about that. And as he came to that honesty, he passed within two weeks. Wow. Uh, there is such a strong emotional, energetic, vibrational, spiritual, whatever words we want to put on a component to the idea of wellness and healing. Yeah. Uh, and just I mean, it's different it's different than a cure in my mind it's oh, very cuz i'm doing super well and yet the doctors say now Sharon remember you're not cured and i go i don't care i'm feeling <laughs> great <laughs> you you label it whatever you want oh i i so agree with you the distinction between healing and curing you know curing is wonderful if it can happen but healing is essential now, I think of another client who came to me, he had a huge tumor like this, and he'd rejected all treatment. And when he came to my office and he told me about, you know, I've told the doctor I don't want any treatment and everything, I just want to die. And so we were, I said, what do you want from me? He said, well, I kind of wonder if I've made a mistake. I said, okay, well, let's work it through, which we did. And it turned out that the first time he ever had sex, he was very young and he had sex with a young girl. And they got pregnant and they were Catholic and he had to marry her and he had four kids and his life had not been anything that he expected or wanted. His wife and he were not getting along very well. His children didn't like him very much. His grandchildren wouldn't come to him. You know, all of this kind of stuff. And I said to him, okay, well, you have a decision to make. I don't know that we can have any hope at all about reversing this cancer because it's so far advanced. But would you like to heal your life? Would you like it so that, what would that look like? Would it look like your wife holding your hand? What, what would it look like? So he told me. So we worked on it. And do you know the last time I saw him in the hospital, his son was shaving him, his wife was holding his hand, and the grandchildren were on his bed playing. Wow. Awesome. awesome. So he healed. <laughs> he wasn't cured. And he signed a DNS. 
because when you have a tumor that large, they bleed spontaneously, and then they have to take extraordinary measures to get blood into you. And he'd had that so many times, and it was so difficult for him. So once he felt he was healed and the love was there and the relationships were healed, he signed a DNS. And, and he could do that. You know, yes, I can tell you lots of stories of people who chose to really restore themselves and did everything that they could, and they indeed healed. Um, And they were far more frequent than the ones who didn't. But this process of inquiry, of really getting in touch with what do you really want, is so powerful, whether you have a diagnosis or you're just asking that question because it happens to be Monday morning, and those are the kind of questions you ask yourself about your life. (laughs) We need to take another quick commercial break, but when we come back, we're going to talk more with Dr. Roberta Shaler about this concept of what do you really want? And as you could hear just in her voice inflection there, that this is not a superficial kind of question. This is a question where you have to go deep inside and really search around. And sometimes it might, you might be surprised with the, the answers that come to you, but we'll talk to her about how we do be able to get deep inside to root around and find those answers for ourselves. We'll be right back. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Change and growth are part of natural life and also part of your spiritual life. Everyone needs support and guidance, especially during life passages. Upgrade yourself with the Om Times Experts Program. With Om Times Experts, you have access to the best intuitive coaches, spiritual teachers, counselors, astrologists, and oracles. Our team was carefully selected so you can trust. Find out more at experts.omtimes.com. Grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and tune in for inspired conversations with publisher Linda Joy on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Linda creates sacred space for leading female luminaries, empowering authors, heart-centered female entrepreneurs, coaches, and healers. A soulful venue where guests openly share the fears and obstacles they've overcome, wisdom and lessons learned, and the personal journey that led them to the transformational work they do in the world. Inspired conversations to empower you on your path to authentic, soulful living. Research shows we apologize up to 10 times a day, and most of the time, we say sorry as a response to someone else's mistake. What if we thanked people instead of all that unnecessary apologizing? So instead of saying, sorry, I'm rambling, you say, thank you for listening. Join us at projectforgive.com, a free non-religious resource on global forgiveness. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm here with Dr. Roberta Shaler, the Relationship Help Doctor, and she has just been providing us amazing, powerful information on not only how to have a deep and meaningful conversation with someone else, and we first started by talking about how do you have a deep and meaningful conversation with a medical professional and still feel that you've got control of yourself and your boundaries and also your sanity as well. Then we talked about this power of intention. And I want to focus on something, Dr. Roberta, about the idea of what do you really want is such a powerful question. And perhaps that's not something we've we've even allowed ourselves to ask in maybe since childhood or or at all. What are some steps that you have when someone says, well, gee, that sounds really good, but gosh, I'm almost even afraid to ask the question because I'm not sure I want to know the real answer. Well, there's that, Sharon. And there's also, like you said, from our childhood, you know, people, we would ask for something and someone would say, well, why do you think you deserve that? Or, you know, who do you think you are? 
And when you're a child and your brain development is not complete because our brains grow until we're 25 and you're only understanding certain things at a certain level with the brain development you have, those things get deeply ingrained into you that I'm not supposed to ask for what I need and want. That makes me selfish. That makes me wanting to be the center of attention or take something away from somebody else. And no, that's not true. You know that old thing about you don't lose any light in your candle when you light the candle of someone else. You know, you are allowed to know what you need and want and think and feel. You absolutely are. That's the joy of being present. You deserve to take up space and draw breath. And when you can own that, even if your parents could not give that to you or the environment in which you were born didn't give that to you, you can do that so that you can then feel free to ask yourself the question, what do I really want? What kind of a life am I creating? Here's a few tips. What are your values? Do you know what your top five values are? The things that you represent that are so dear to you, you wouldn't want to be without them. Then what's your vision for your life? Not somebody else's, not somebody else's expectations. What's the vision for your life? What did you want it to look like? What is the contribution you want to make? What, what is that all about? So your values, then your vision, then your beliefs. Not only your spiritual beliefs, which are important, but what do you believe about the world? What do you believe about people? What do you believe about how money works? How, what do you believe about how influence works? What are the beliefs that you have? And then the last thing is, what are your current purposes and goals and challenges? And how are you going to meet them, the ones that are today? So your values, your vision, your beliefs, and your goals and purposes. And when you get in touch with that, then you start to say, you know, I am the author of my life. I decide. I know. I know what I need and I can go and ask for it. I know what I want and I can ask for it or go and get it. And you get clarity and you're not living up to the expectations of other people. You know, in the book Soul Solitude, we talk about two big predicaments among many, but two main ones we talk about in there. One is our addiction to drama and the other is our living up to the expectations of other people. We're not here to live up to the expectations of other people. Did you know that? <laughs> Just because your mother, your mother told you that you should never wear black doesn't mean that you don't ever have to wear black, you know? That's her thing, not yours necessarily. So when you look at what do I really want, and you do it with a deep level of inquiry because you really want to know. And then you ask yourself the secondary question, why do I want that? And you go deep. Maybe you get some help. I do this with my clients. And what's really down there? What is driving your life? Then maybe we look at what are your fears? But these things will help you heal. Whether you have a diagnosis or not, you want to heal your life. You want your life to feel healthy, that you have strong boundaries, that you know where you're going, that you know you have the right to ask her things. You're not back here in the corner like, oh, don't see me, you know, and I'll do whatever you want to keep the peace. That's a very disempowered place to be. Absolutely. Whether we're talking to our medical professionals as we first started out or as we've gone further down this path to understand even in our personal private relationships, a very disempowering place to be. One little tip I want to share about that. Why do I want that question? I always encourage myself and others to ask several times, ask myself several times, because mm -hmm. usually the first why for me, a little superficial, a little easy to answer, a little uh, maybe not deep enough. And I find that if I go, okay, I'm going to write that down and I'm going to ask myself, why else do I want that? Mm -hmm. What more about that do I want? And I find that I get to a much more significant place if I ask myself that question several times. Oh, I so agree. And the distinction that I make and, and that you're pointing out so wisely, Sharon, is the distinction between surfing and diving. We don't want to just surf along like, oh, I got a little answer, a surface answer. I want to know that I deserve to go and dive down and say, yeah, what's underneath that? What's underneath that? What's underneath that? Do I get down? Do I can sit there and go, ah, okay, that's what's driving the bus here. Now that's let me driving the bus. I like that. 
Yeah. So there's so many powerful things we can do for ourselves, but we have to believe we matter. So we're back to that. And absolutely give your gifts to the world. But you can't give a gift you don't have. If you don't have it within you, you can't give it. And you may be wanting it from other people, but you're not. it's not reflected in you because you're not giving it. You're not giving it to yourself, so you don't have it to give to other people. And then when that happens, we get into resentment. When we get into resentment, the body doesn't like that. Resentment works on the inside. Maybe it'll be an autoimmune uh, exacerbation or a flare-up. Maybe it will be a headache. Maybe it will be a churning gut. Maybe it'll be something more chronic. But resentment will cause things to go wrong. And let me just say a statistic that I mentioned to you the other day, and I think it's important to know the work of Gabar Mate in Canada, Dr. Mate. And he, because I work with people who are the partners and the exes and the adult children of hijackals, it really pertains to them. So I was happy to have the statistic. When we live in chronic stress coupled with chronic anxiety, they have to be hooked together. Chronic stress and chronic anxiety as women his research shows that the incidence of us cre uh, having breast cancer goes up nine times. That's a shocking statistic. Absolutely shocking statistic. And I like to think of that when we have those two coupled together. I have this visualization. I like to, my brain works in metaphors. And I always have this visualization that my fight or flight, the switch has been stuck on. Mm-hmm. And so what would it, how do I turn that switch off? Beautiful. Sometimes that can get switched on and you, it's been there switched on for so long that you're not even aware that it's on anymore. Right. That somehow becomes sort of your new normal. Mm -hmm. I want to circle back and talk about something though. When we were talking about just sitting there at, as we said, sort of at the bottom of the pond, you know, uh, we'd gotten to that point. I've heard from several people to tell me things like, Oh, but I couldn't do that. That feels so selfish. I know you have a great de definition of selfish. So share with us this idea of taking care of ourselves first and how other people can say the, say the word selfish. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, back in the day when we had tapes, Sharon, um, I had had a talk that I called being positively selfish. And I meant that as a double entendre because there is positivity in selfishness. And it's not about self-centeredness. It's about being able to put yourself first when it matters and keeps you in balance and when to know when to put others and other things ahead of yourself. But we're always balancing. I don't believe as humans we're ever balanced. I believe every day we're balancing. And so we have to be in that balancing place between going within and coming without. And that's what creates balance. To go into the silence or the question or descend into those kinds of places we were just talking about. Get some answers. Get some clarity. Come out and express an experience in the world. Go back. This balance is what gives us health. And when we get into this, like you were just talking about, always the switch is on. You know, this is exhausting. Be more, do more, have more, be more, do more, have more. Forget about yourself. It's all about other people. No. You know, if I could take one phrase out of the English language, there are two that I don't like, but one in particular, I would ban the phrase, give until it hurts. Mm. It's absurd. It's absurd. The whole world would be hurting. And all we need to do to have things to give is to have them within us. Love, peace, joy, clarity, um, respect, trust, honesty. We have these things, so we have them within and they're developed and we're demonstrating them. We have them to give. Those are our gifts to the relationship. But if we haven't developed them, we're going to be like, how do I get into your game? No, oh, you don't have a contribution to the relationship if it's all about their game. You need to know who you are. And what are, what are the things that are important to you? Who you are and how you want to be and, and be able to tell yourself 
what all these things mean to you and then develop those things so that you are a walking example of your values and your vision for life and your beliefs. I love that. I love that. That's a fantastic place. We'll have to have Dr. Roberta Shaler back. This is awesome. As always, when I get with Dr. Roberta, we run out of time, <laughs> which we have. Please, please, uh, Dr. Roberta, share with everyone how they can find out more about you and your podcasts as well, Emotional Savvy Show and Save Your Sanity, as well as all of your books. Just here, share. Sure. Well, first of all, come and find me at forrelationshiphelp.com, F-O-R relationship, H-E-L-P.com. And then you can go to my YouTube channel, which surprisingly has the same name. So youtube.com slash forrelationshiphelp. Then wherever you enjoy getting your podcasts, you can find Emotional Savvy and Save Your Sanity. And in particular, Save Your Sanity is also running on the Mental Health News Radio Network. So you can go and find it there as well. Then the Binge TV Network, available on your Roku, on your Apple TV, your Samsung, your TiVo, 50 different networks. My show there is called Emotional Savvy. So there are lots of ways you can get in touch with me. And of course, all my books are on Amazon. But always remember you spell my name R-H-O-B-E-R-T-A. Otherwise, you'll get tripped up. So Roberta, R-H-O-B-E-R-T-A, and then you get the next H-S-H-A-L-E-R. Oh, I'm glad you spelled it. Yes, it is. that trips up, especially since our last names are so similar. My tongue always gets twisted up. We'll have the spelling of her name over at understandingautoimmune.com, as well as the podcast and the video of this. You can find that as sign up for Courage Club and get your free transcript. I love the transcript, especially for a show that was as deep as we went today with Dr. Roberta. She gave us a lot of tips and clues and even ways to say things. And we can hear it and we're going, yes, yes. But get the transcript because you're able to read through it point by point, highlight it, and sometimes even use it as a script. Practice, 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 as you mentioned. Be sure and practice some of this. If it doesn't feel like it comes natural, you can just say it out loud to yourself. Practice. So thank you, Dr. Roberta. We're going to have to have you back because this was awesome. We just went very, very deep here today. Check us out on YouTube to see the videos. That is over at YouTube forward slash understanding autoimmune. Have a great weekend. Whatever your adventures, enjoy. The information provided on LifeInterruptedRadio.com is for educational purposes only. What you hear, read, and see on Life Interrupted Radio is based on experience only. The information presented here should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on Life Interrupted Radio. Mm-hmm.